Okay, the next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 3839 in the name of Fiona Hislop on celebrating the 200th anniversary of the Union Canal and its contribution to Scotland. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put, but I encourage members who wish to participate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Fiona Hislop to open the debate for around seven minutes, Ms Hislop. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am delighted to bring my members' debate to Parliament this afternoon, marking the 200th anniversary of the Union Canal, which flows through my constituency, and to celebrate its economic, environmental and social value to the communities it connects. I have crossed the bridge at the Linlithgow Canal Basin almost every day for 25 years, and it is a very special place to me. I would also note the 200th anniversary of the Caledonian Canal. This celebration, of course, extends to the contribution made by the many staff and volunteers who are involved in the upgrading, maintenance and championing of the Union Canal and the boaters. And I would like to welcome in particular those from Scottish Canals and the Linlithgow Union Canal Society to the gallery today. I would also like to thank the MSPs who signed my motion. Our infrastructure connects us from place to place but it also connects people. It connects communities, ideas and livelihoods. And if done correctly, it has the power to change the world. The Union Canal is no different. The Union Canal was conceived in 1793 as part of the Industrial Revolution to be a direct route for the people of Edinburgh to access cheap sources of coal from the West and was named as the Union Canal as it connected Edinburgh and Glasgow. In 1813, a survey was undertaken to link the proposed canal to the Forth and Clyde canals, and construction was approved in Parliament in 1817. The 30-mile Union Canal was built between Edinburgh and Falkirk in just four years and opened in 1822. I also want to pay tribute to those who built the canal. The construction work was hard, laborious work with horses, carts and shovels, and men lost their lives building it. And it is said that the red paint on some of the canal bridges marks those deaths in constructing the canal. The increase in use of rail and road led to a steady decline, and the canal was formally closed in 1965. It then reopened in 2001 as part of the 83.5 million uh, Millennium Link and was the largest canal restoration anywhere in Britain. I had the pleasure of attending the touching ceremony at the Broxburn Basin in 2001, where the late Mel Gray, one of the founders of the Linlithgow Union Canal Society, extended a finger to connect with the finger of the captain of the boat which had travelled from Edinburgh, a dramatic moment reminiscent of the creation of Adam on the Sistine Chapel and marked the first time in many years that boats could again travel from Falkirk to Edinburgh. The Falkirk Wheel was built in 2002, reconnecting the Forth and Clyde Canal for the first time in 70 years with the Union Canal. And this Saturday, to mark the last 200 years, we'll, we'll see a flotilla of 200 boats pass through the canal. It is clear, President Officer, that canals were the lifeblood of the past and they firmly have a place in the future. The Union Canal supports the protection, conservation and enhancement of the biodiversity of the waterway and is an integral part of the green infrastructure promoting sustainable active travel. Scottish Canals, working with partners on pioneering projects, is helping to combat flooding and driving positive transformation in some of Scotland's most disadvantaged areas. The Falkirk Wheel, alongside the Grangemouth Kelpies, are two of the most significant contributors in terms of tourism in the Forth Valley, worth £110 million to the local economy, supporting 2,000 jobs. The Falkirk Wheel replaced 11 lock gates, cutting the travel time between the two canals from almost 24 hours to just 10 minutes. Both the Wheel and the Kelpies are within the top 10 of Scotland's most visited attractions. An independent research shows that spending time on or by the waterways can make people happier and improve life satisfaction and social well-being. The Union Canal towpath is regularly used by my constituents for cycling, walking and wheeling, encouraging physical health and mental well-being, and the National Cycling and Walking Network runs along the Union Canal towpath. But the success of the Union Canal would not be possible without the hard work and dedication of a number of people. And I, I, I welcome those that have joined uh, our gallery today from the Lithgow Union Canal Society again, and to those from Scottish Canals. 
The uh, late Mel Grey, I mentioned previously, was a driving force in revitalising the canal long before the Millennium Project, and the Education Centre at the Linlithgow Canal Basin is named in his honour. Another founding member is the formidable and remarkable Barbara Braithwaite, MBE, and I send her my best wishes. Chris Matheson is the current chair of Lux, who has been in the post since last year, and I wish him well for the future in this role. Pat Bowie was a manager of Reunion, which aims to encourage communities to engage positively with the canal. Richard Miller, the brains behind the Falkirk Wheel and the Kelpies. Billy King worked with the canals for decades and has been responsible for the upkeep and maintenance along the Union Canal. George Burney was instrumental in the reopening of the waterways as part of the Millennium Link and has played a crucial part in the Union Canal for the last 40 years. And of course, the late Ronnie Rusick, MBE, owner of the Bridge Inn in Rathal, who in 1974 created a floating dining experience on the Union Canal and became chairman of the Seagull Trust. Ronnie was instrumental in the reopening of the Union Canal, receiving an MBE for his efforts bringing press and prime ministers alike to the banks of the canal to drum up support for the reopening. Ronnie was chair of Scottish Waterways for All until he passed away in 2020. Scottish Waterways for All should also be commended as an organisation, as should the Seagull Trust, formed in the 1970s to offer free boat trips to, for those with disabilities along the canal. And of course, Scottish canals are a key stakeholder in the £1 billion Winchborough development. The Union Canal is at the heart of this project in my constituency with a new canal marina which has residential houses as well as moorings alongside and is an attractive and central part of Winchborough as it grows. So countries across the world look to Scotland for inspiration, innovation and education on many things and our impressive canal structure is certainly one of them. They look to us because we are a nation that puts placemaking at the heart of our infrastructure. We put communities and people at the heart of planning. So I commend the work undertaken by Scottish canals and local groups uh, such as the Lithgow Union Canal Society, of whom I'm very proud, and look forward to working with them to ensure that the Union Canal remains vibrant and accessible and paves the way for the next 200 years. Thank you very much, Ms Hislop. We now move to the open debate. I call first uh, Graeme Simpson to be followed by Gordon Macdonald for around four minutes, Mr Simpson. Uh, well, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank Fiona Hislop uh, for bringing this uh, motion to, to the Chamber? Um, it's a very long motion, I have to say, um, but it covers, uh, it covers a lot and there's a lot to say. Um, I haven't written out a speech, a Deputy Presiding Officer, because I just want to say um, what I think about the canal, actually. Um, and I might, be, I might be the only person in this chamber, I don't know, it could be wrong, but I might be the only one, we'll put it to the test, who's actually cycled uh, all the way along the canal from Edinburgh to Glasgow. Um, but if anyone else has, they can raise their hands. So it looks, it looks like I'm the only one that's done it. Um, I then um, made the uh, mistake of uh, also cycling back to my home in East Kilbride, which is uphill, uh, and that uh, rather ruined what had been a, a very fine day. And I've done, I've done, uh, I've d I've done bits of it as well. Um, I, I really love the Union Canal bit, but I think the Falkirk uh, element of it is particularly special. And uh, Fiona Hislop mentioned that it's the 20th birthday party of the Falkirk Wheel, a quite incredible structure link linking the two canals. But if you're coming from Edinburgh, um, in order to get to the Falkirk Wheel, you have to pass through the Falkirk Tunnel, um, which is quite long and could be quite eerie, but it is lit. Um, uh, it's 630 metres long, 18 foot wide, 19 foot high, uh, and it has a 5 foot wide towpath. Um, and at one end of the tunnel, there is a plaque uh, which tells us that mass murderers Burke and Hare worked on the tunnel. Um, and the, 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 the local interest is that Burke's mistress, Helen McDougall, was a local girl. Uh, and of course, Burke and Hare then went on to murder 16 people and sold their bodies to an anatomy school, 
uh, and it's thought uh, rather concerningly that they disposed of bodies in the canal. I'm sure they're not there uh, anymore. But I think, I think that, that, you know, a, I, I mention this because there's a rich history uh, to, to the canal, uh, both the Union Canal and the Forth and Clyde Canal. Um, and from my point of view, the value of it for me is, is, is just that, that sort of act, that, that getting people out in the open. It's such a great resource to have on so many people's doorsteps, going from Edinburgh across, you know, across to Glasgow, the two canals now connected. Um, so it's fantastic to have. You can get out, you can, do, you can walk it. Um, I've seen you know, people fish in the canals. Uh, and of course, uh, there will be that great uh, flotilla, uh, which should be a, a marvelous sight to see, I think, this, this weekend. So I'll, 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 end it, I'll end it there, I think, uh, presiding officer, um, just to thank Fiona Hislop again. Um, I think you know, the canal has a great future. Scottish canals uh, are to be commended for maintaining it, uh, keeping it going, and I hope that more and more people get the opportunity to go and see it and use it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Mr. Simpson. I now call uh, Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Sarah Boyack for around four minutes. Mr. MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thanks to Fiona Hislop for bringing this debate forward. The Edinburgh and Glasgow Union Canal, to give it its full name, runs through my constituency of Edinburgh Pentlands, from Slateford through Kingsnow and Wester Hills to Ratho in the west. The canal joined Edinburgh to the Forth and Clyde Canal, linking Edinburgh to Glasgow, thus uniting the two cities. The canal was planned by Hugh Baird so that it would follow the 250-foot contour line through its 31-mile length and was on the level sorry, and as it was on the level meant that it had no lock gates making transit along its length quicker. To achieve this, three aqueducts were required over the water relief at Slateford the River Almond near Linlithgow and the River Almond at Ratho. The canal opened in 1822 and was initially successful carrying minerals from the mines and quarries in Lanarkshire to Edinburgh, but in 1842 the Edinburgh and Glasgow Railway opened and it fell into slow commercial decline and was closed to commercial traffic in 1933 and finally closed in 1965. <clears throat> the building of the Wester Hills estate in my constituency began in 1967 at Drumbryden, and over a mile of the canal from Drumbryden Road to Calder Crescent was filled in and culvert piped to water through the new estate due to concerns about child safety. In 1994, British Waterways, after neglecting the canal for over 30 years, decided to restore both the Union and the Forth and Clyde canals to link up the west and east coasts of Scotland with fully navigable waterways for the first time in over 35 years. However, there was a problem. The Wester Hills section needed to be reopened with a new channel, new bridges and diverted roads. Work began in late 1999 and it took nearly two years to complete. During this period when the new channel was being built, it was found that the original stone arched Hills Bridge had been buried inside the Dumbryden Road embankment back in the 1960s. It was repaired and is now in use as a footbridge over the canal. Tomorrow, Scottish canals will celebrate the 200th anniversary of the Union Canal in Edinburgh Pentlands by organising a flotilla of canal boats accompanied by musical performances that will travel from Lochran Basin in central Edinburgh to Bridge 8 in Wester Hills. The aim is to celebrate the ongoing commercial, social and historical value of the canal to the economy and the local community, bringing together canal users and canal side communities in a celebration of the past, present and future use of the waterway. As part of the celebrations, there will be a world premiere of Union Caledonia 200 at Harrison Park, a song written to commemorate the Union and Caledonia Canal's bicentennial, as well as a variety of musical acts on and off the water. In my constituency in Wester Hales, residents supported by Whale Arts and Edinburgh Art Festival have organised local activities to coincide with the passing of the flotilla, including a canal trail stretching from Hales Quarry Park to Bridge 8 Hub and Paddles Cafe with a treasure hunt, raft building, art activities with artists Pester and Rossi and a free community meal at Whale Arts. 
Pres presiding officer, when I came to Edinburgh in 1982, the Union Canal was a neglected ribbon of water through the southwest of the city. Now it is a valuable leisure space, whether you are walking or cycling, canoeing or indeed holidaying on one of the canal boats. What a transformation in 40 years and long may it continue. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Macdonald. I now call Sarah Boyack to be followed by Bob Doris again around four minutes. Ms Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First of all, I also want to thank Fiona Hislop for giving us this opportunity to debate the 200 years and to celebrate the 200 years of the Union Canal. And as she said in her opening remarks, it is an incredible piece of engineering infrastructure and I think all of us need to ensure that it continues to get the investment needed going forward, whether it's keeping the canal bridges usable or making the canal navigable, uh, ongoing for canoeists or canal boats. Uh, I've personally been interested in it as a part of our history and culture, the fantastic connecting route it is through central Scotland, from my time as a town planner in central region to being a minister in Donald Dewar's cabinet, when I was privileged to see the plans for the Falkirk Wheel and be part of the Millennium Project. Donald Dewar himself cut the first sod of turf in 1999, at the start of the reconnection of the Forth and Clyde Canal with the Union Canal. And as an Edinburgh resident, I also love walking or cycling beside the canal. I can tell Graeme Simpson, my route is Linlithgow to Edinburgh or Falkirk to Linlithgow. That is quite enough for me. But actually, the point about the canal is you can choose your route, you can choose how long you want to go, and it's accessible to people. And that's what we really want to celebrate today. It's at the heart of the city in Edinburgh, and it's an incredible, popular green space. And the regeneration of the city centre, where we used to have a historic brewery, that at one time produced two million barrels a year and was a key local employer, in recent years, we've moved from that to see a welcome regeneration, with the Borough Muir High School opening in 2018, new homes, cafes, art venues, such as the Edinburgh Printmakers Gallery. And most recently, I have been involved in the inspiring project proposed by the late Chris Wigglesworth, a former Labour councillor, geologist, church minister and community activist. And he came up with this proposal called A Fountain for Fountain Bridge which uses Archimedes wheel principles, a gravity-led fountain, which we were able to get being included in the development plans and the proposals to provide new homes and regenerate the area. It's in the plans, and I very much want to thank uh, the Fountain Bridge Canal side members, community activists, and the work of the Harriet Watt academics and students who took uh, Chris's project and developed it and said how we could actually implement it. Um, I want to thank all the local activists today, not just for their commitment in supporting the Fountain for Fountain Bridge project, but for all of the work that they do, promoting access to the canal. It's a key part of our community. It's a mixed, sustainable environment. It's biodiverse. It improves people's quality of life. It's socially inclusive, and it gives us a well-being neighbourhood. That is something to celebrate, and that's just the city centre part of the canal. Uh, like Gordon MacDonald, I'm also really looking forward. Uh, sorry, Gordon, my, my brain has gone. I'm really looking forward to tomorrow's flotilla celebration organised by Scottish Canals, and I want to thank them for all their work too. I am also looking forward to networking with our new councillors, our local community and businesses, and to continue to maximise the positive impact of the canal as a fantastic feature. And as Fiona Hislop's motion highlights, it brings joy to all of those who use the canal and the access it gives to our communities. Let's hope that it continues to do that for years to come. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Ms Boyack. I now call on Bob Doris to be followed by Alexander Stewart for around four minutes, Mr Doris. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And as others have done, I want to thank Fiona Hislop for securing this afternoon's debate celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Union Canal. It is important to celebrate our canals not only as historical structures, a visual testament to our industrial heritage, but also as thriving waterways being increasingly utilised to assist driving community regeneration and providing an important amenity for communities nearby our canal towpaths. That is certainly the case for the Forth and Clyde Canal, which winds its way through my constituency of Mary Helen Springburn. Can I again thank you lot for now giving me the opportunity to say a little bit about that. The Forth and Clyde Canal was first discussed during the reign of Charles II, indeed, but work did not commence until June 1768, and the canal fully opened some 22 years later. 
By 1775, the canal opened as far as Stogsfield Junction in Mary Hill. Presiding officer, that is hugely significant. It's later this summer a £13.7 million new bridge will open there, funded by the Scottish Government to finally complete the canal towpath network. It will connect the communities of Rutkill, Mary Hill and Gelshell for the first time and be the, finally be the final link in completing that canal towpath. Our canals once again connected communities, not cutting them off. And I pay tribute to the work of Scottish Canals for the work they do championing such improvements. And I reiterate the passion of uh, Richard Muller, who is here today, that Fiona Hislop uh, mentioned earlier. I know that many members will be aware of the wonderful work Scottish Canals have done at the clay pits at the Forth and Clyde Canal, on the, the north bank of which sits in my constituency. It is Glasgow's only inner city nature reserve and is a magnificent parkland with breathtaking views. It is also the area where clay was extracted to line the Forth and Clyde Canal over 200 years ago. Members should visit it. Of course, visit the Union Canal first, because that is what the debate is about, but they should visit the clay pits. It is stunning. However, it is to be commended not just for its views and vibrant habitat, but because its benefits, it benefits the communities on the doorstep, such as Hamilton Hill and Wester Common in my constituency. The clay pits are a key community asset of national significance, right in the heart of areas been impacted by deprivation and associated issues for many years. Yes? Graham Simpson. I thank Bob Dorries for taking the intervention. I'd just like to wholeheartedly agree with him uh, about the clay pits. Uh, you know, it is a, is a wonderful area, um, but I, I think Sustrans uh, and indeed uh, Glasgow City Council should also be commended for some of the new routes that, that link in, into that, that, that canal. So that enables people in his constituency to get to it uh, far easier. Bob Doris, I can give you the time back. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Mr Simmons is absolutely right, and I am pleased for the intervention because, due to time constraints, I cannot talk about all the partners who have supported this wonderful initiative. So thank you, Mr Simmons, for putting that on the record. In fact, it is an £8.8 .8 million investment, which is so much activity, which is actually community led, just like the Union Canal that Fiona Hislop was talking about. And it is community led through the Clay Pits Local Nature Reserve Management Group, and I want to put that on the record here today. And commencing this year at Hamilton Hill, which is much derelict land caused by demolitions in years gone by. There will be over 670 new homes, including hundreds of social and mid-market rent properties, starting to be built between Glasgow City Council and Queen's Cross Housing Associates Working Partnership, the canals, our canal network for positive change, and the smart canal being used for flooding solutions will see over 3,000 homes built in that area in the years ahead. But with the time I have got left, President Officer, we can take you back up to Stockingfield Bridge, my constituency, where I started. I would encourage members to walk the towpath back up there, carry on past up Codder, where the Council have agreed to turn, it in, turn Codder Woods into a local nature reserve, although much work still needs to be done, and head up on up to Lambhill Stables, a wonderful community anchor facility there. But if some do not want to walk that far, just stay along the Mary Hill area and go to Mary Hill Walks and the White House, which is also there, where you can look up at Osprey Heights of still game fame. The area below is known affectionately as the Botany, or the Botany, short for Botany Bay, the location where those being deported to Australia used to start their journey many years ago. No such fate awaits visitors in this chamber here today. Well, I certainly hope not. Uh, one part, it's just one part of a great walking day out celebrating the Forth and Clyde Canal network within Mary Hill and Springburn. But I'll finish by saying that it's remiss of me that I've not walked along the Union Canal. Can I assure Fiona Hislop that's something I will rectify? And to thank Fiona Hislop for lodging this motion here today and reminding all of us in this chamber and beyond the wonderful legacy we have for Scotland's canal network, not least of all the Union Canal. Thank you, Mr Doris. I am sure Ms Hislop will hold you to that undertaking. And I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Michelle Thompson. Around four minutes, Mr Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I also thank Fiona Hislop for bringing this debate to the Chamber. I think it is very poignant and very right that we are debating it this afternoon. As we have heard, Tuesday the 3rd of March 1818 was a poignant day in Scotland's canal history, as the first pickaxe was struck to mark the beginning of the construction of the Edinburgh and Glasgow Union Canal. This was a monumental project at the time, uh, a contour canal designed by the engineer Hugh Baird and supported by the great Thomas Telford. 
the new canal was to navigate from Edinburgh through the lands of Lord Buchan, eventually joining with the Forth and Clyde Canal at Falkirk and opening in 1822. Routing the initial plans from Edinburgh uh, followed the contour lines and it traversed through Ratho and Boxburn uh, and just after Linlithgow uh, there was a, a real hurdle uh, that the, the construction met uh, and that was the, the basin surrounding uh, the River Avon which crossed the path at the new canal route. Hugh Baird consulted uh, Thomas Telford in the plans to overcome uh, what became a hugely innovative design. Uh, that resulted in the construction of a 12 arch advocate, advocate, ad, can't even say it now, aqueduct is the word, and the second largest in Britain uh, 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 and the largest in Scotland at the time. All of this amazing achievement uh, came over 30 years and the Forth and Clyde Canal was initially opened when Baird uh, decided to join them at Falkirk in central Edinburgh. Uh, 30 miles of lock-free level towpath was there, constructed rivering and dropping down to a single flight of 11 locks at the top of the 4th and Clyde own 16 lock. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, canals bring truly uh, fantastic engineering to the fore. And as we've heard, uh, the, the whole idea of that uh, was uh, a ma magnificent uh, uh, in, in, in making sure that happened. And, you know, we, we've, we've also heard how that uh, the, the Falkirk wheel then became a part of that process. And that opened uh, 20 years ago uh, this month uh, as part of the Millennium Link project. It was the largest engineering project uh, to have been undertaken by British Waterways in Scotland. Uh, 78 million uh, was, was spent uh, on the, the Forth and Clyde Union Canals within that process. It succeeded in linking the west and the east coast of Scotland uh, for the first time since the 1960s. Uh, and founded by the Millennium Commission, uh, the Millennium Link uh, has been invaluable to kickstart uh, the interest and attractions uh, and the, the microeconomics that will bring to that. Uh, so, so, Deputy Presiding, well, lockdowns and, and the entire pandemic has brought many uh, acute difficulties to the fore, not least via isolation and loneliness and poor mental health. And all of that uh, can be uh, dealt with when you look at something like the canal that we have here. Uh, so society needs to have attractions uh, close at hand because it indicates and it gives the opportunity for joy of uh, the communities. Uh, the canal has generated interest across uh, many visitors and many organisations and has already been said today, walkers, cyclists and, and boating enthusiasts all uh, have taken part in the process. I turn uh, many of the, the, the famous uh, uh, canal infrastructures, and, and, and it's the envy of the world. Uh, there's no question uh, that it was uh, so poignant and so uh, uh, fundamental. Uh, and the, the, the volunteers and the partner organisations that have participated and supported down the generations all need to be congratulated uh, and commended for what they've done. You know, the, the, Sco the Scottish ca uh, canals and waterways, the trust, uh, the Lowland Canals volunteer group, as well as British Waterways Scotland, they've all played their part. Uh, and, and it's through them that we can enjoy and we can participate uh, today. And I hope that continues for many years to come. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Stewart. I now call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Stephen Kerr for around four minutes. Ms. Thompson. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And in common with others, I thank my friend and colleague Fiona Hislop for bringing this debate to Parliament. And despite a frankly all-encompassing motion paying such a fitting tribute that managed to fit all of that in, I hope my short contribution brings some further insights, including the need for imagination and future ambition as we address the economic needs of Scotland today. So when first built, the Union Canal, and we can't underestimate that, was a tribute to the ingenuity and innovation of both the designers and the builders of the day. 31 and a half miles along and Scotland's only contour canal, known locally at the time as the Mathematical River, for very good reason. So in following this 240 foot contour through its length by way of 62 fixed bridges, quite a remarkable innovation has allowed for traffic to flow at speed and rendering locks unnecessary. And that can't, can't be underestimated. If it was a considerable feat of engineering today, it was utterly remarkable and inspiring all those years ago. 
So, of course, it meanders through my constituency of Falkirk East, and I have to lay claim that it was Burke who worked on the canal at Madison in Falkirk East, uh, also from the West Quarter in the West, traversing Pullman, and then on towards the east side, near Muir Avon side, and eventually heading across the quite remarkable Avon Aqueduct and onwards to Edinburgh, and much of that has been covered today. So, of course, not only was it a source of employment for many people in communities that are now part of Falkirk East then and now, it smoothed supply chains, created spin-off enterprises and supported community development. So it is remarkable to think that such a huge infrastructure development with its innovative design built around the great ambition to improve and facilitate trade remains a great symbol of the imagination and skills of Scotland. The ingenuity and innovation is reflected today in a quite frankly wonderful year-long programme of events already mentioned. We have to be, aspire to be similarly imaginative about the future. I'd like to see Falkirk East and indeed the Fourth Valley become the hub for new investment aimed at sustainable international trade. We've got to set ourselves today the task of emulating the foresight and drive so evident in designing and building the canal 200 years ago. So I give tri tribute and a great many thanks to the people involved, but I also want to mention in particular the leadership and board of Scottish Canals. Given my own debate held last week on the subject of women in business, it's inspiring to note that such an innovative programme is overseen by a board where four of the six members are female, with the chair of the board being Maureen Campbell and chief executive Catherine Topley. Presiding officer, much of today's debate is focused on both the history of the canal and the many types of events forming the celebrations that are now in place. Perhaps my short plea is the greatest tribute we can pay all those involved from the time that the canal was merely an idea through to today is to mobilise the imagination, the knowledge and skills once more in a major and ambitious programme to better engage Scotland with the wider world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Thompson. And now the final speaker in the open debate, Stephen Kerr, for around four minutes, Mr Kerr. My goodness, presiding officer, I find myself in complete agreement with Michelle Thompson. We don't always agree, but on this occasion, every word she has said, I completely agree with. And I do congratulate her colleague, uh, Fiona Hislop, on bringing this debate to the Chamber. And you know, one of the wonderful upsides, there are many upsides to campaigning, I love campaigning, um, but one of, the, one of the upsides of it is you get to know the area that, uh, that you live in and represent that much better. And that's been true of me in Falkirk over the last few months. And it's given me an opportunity to really appreciate the importance of the Union Canal to, cent to the central Scotland economy, particularly in Falkirk, in the way that Michelle Thompson so ably described. The Union Canal is home to the Falkirk Wheel, the world's first and only rotating boat lift. And when opened by Her Majesty the Queen as part of her Golden Jubilee celebrations in 2002, it connected the Union Canal and the Forth and Clyde Canal for the first time since the 1930s. And 15 years later, Her Majesty the Queen visited Falkirk once again to officially open the Queen Elizabeth II Canal uh, beside the Kelpies, Scotland's newest inland waterway. And the Queen Elizabeth II Canal is a world-class marine hub in and out of Scotland, which shows the economic importance of our canals, including the Union Canal. And the Falkirk Wheel and the Kelpies just show how our canals remain one of Scotland's great tourist attractions, with both venues receiving over half a million visitors a year before the COVID pandemic. Despite, of course, Graham Simpson. I thank uh, Stephen Kerr for taking the intervention. Um, can I uh, suggest to uh, Stephen Kerr uh, that he may want to take advantage of the fourth bike hubs? Um, at the Falkirk Wheel, he could cycle uh, by electric bike from the Falkirk Wheel to the Kelpies and back again. Uh, it's a great resource, and uh, I would suggest that uh, Michelle Thompson may like to do likewise. Over to you, Stephen Kerr. As long, the, the words riding an e-bike, I'm attracted to that idea because I enjoy riding e-bikes, as long as it doesn't involve returning to East Cobride right up all the hills that you were describing. Uh, uh, so, I'm, I'm, yes. I, I'm going to come on to the importance of the active travel dimension of the canals in a second, if I might. Um, I was about to say that despite the success I was describing, uh, we can't afford to become complacent. And I think we must 
continually seek ways to promote the benefit of the, that the Union Canal brings to the people of Falkirk and the economy of Falkirk. And that's why I was delighted to hear that as part of the Falkirk growth deal signed by the UK and Scottish governments and Falkirk Council, that will, it will result in the development of Lock 16 at, in Camelon. And this development will see the Union Canal directly resulting in job creation, training and community engagement throughout the Falkirk area. And also as part of the Falkirk growth deal, there's a commitment to create an active travel network which connects Falkirk's tourist sites with the high street, and that's very much needed. Now, my Conservative colleagues and I in Falkirk believe that this network must utilise the Union Canal, making it easier to walk, cycle and, indeed, use e-bikes uh, along the bank of the canal. And we also want to conserve the natural beauty of the Union Canal, and that means that during the construction of the active travel network, we must focus on a design that complements the natural beauty that the Union Canal already provides. And I must say, I think that does mean that we need to address something that's not been mentioned so far, and that is the, the litter problem that we often find alongside the canal. When walking the canal uh, recently, I, I, I must confess, it, it wasn't as pretty as a, a sight as it should have been because of the discarded empty drink cans and packets of crisps and all the other detritus that you find sometimes alongside these very beautiful sites we have in Scotland. An appropriate way to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the Union Canal would therefore perhaps be to launch a, a campaign to, to clean up alongside the canal. Local authorities obviously would, would work with the, or should work with the community groups that exist along the whole of the canal to see this project to its completion. During its 200-year history, the Union Canal has continuously demonstrated how important it is for central Scotland's economic development and tourism. And yet, I don't believe, and this is to echo what Michelle Thompson said, I don't believe that we're yet fulfilling the full potential it can provide. To support the Falkirk Wheel, the Kelpies, and the natural beauty of the canal, we must continue to invest in the canal by, by cleaning it up, cleaning up the, the view that it provides its visitors and delivering a state-of-the-art active travel network alongside its bank. That, I'm sure, must be music to the ears of the Minister, who will now speak, I presume. Thank you, Mr Kerr. We will soon find out. I invite Patrick Harvey to respond to the debate, Minister, for around about seven minutes, please. Presiding officer, like other members across the chamber, can I warmly congratulate Fiona Heslop uh, for bringing this motion for, for debate, and unless I'm wide of the mark in, in reading the room, I, I don't think there's been anything dry about any of the, the discussions and, and contributions today. I think members across the chamber have taken real enjoyment uh, in sharing their own personal experiences uh, of the Union Canal and Scotland's other canals uh, and, uh, and discussing not only the history, uh, older history and more recent history of their regeneration, but also uh, hopes for the future. So I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to close the debate on behalf of the government, celebrating the 200th anniversary of the Union Canal and its contribution to Scotland. Scotland's canals have been on an extraordinary journey over those 200 years, and it's, uh, it's a fitting opportunity, I think, today to celebrate this impressive, enduring example uh, of Scotland's engineering past, the contribution that it makes in the present uh, and that it will continue to make in the future. And it is amazing when you travel down what's today a relatively peaceful Union Canal to think of it as once having been at the beating heart of an industrial revolution, uh, transporting coal from Falkirk and fur further afield, powering the factories uh, of the capital. The Union Canal's relevance has changed remarkably since then, but it is still very relevant indeed. And its refurbishment uh, back in the 1970s with volunteers' amazing efforts uh, to turn the canal around uh, is, uh, is something Scotland uh, and those, those communities must be really proud of. Its transformation uh, over those years has seen its uses evolve dramatically, creating fantastic outdoor spaces that are used in so many different ways. My own favourite recollection uh, is when I was uh, appointed convener of Parliament's Transport Committee. And back in those days, Parliament's committees were a little too enthusiastic to put boring, sterile, overpriced meeting rooms in posh hotels for their annual away days. So I thought, how dull. 
and I persuaded our committee clerks to book a, a canal barge uh, operated by a social enterprise and decked out as a boardroom uh, for us to conduct our away day. And various slightly surprised committee members and expert witnesses uh, discussed our uh, work programme as we uh, potted up to Ratho and back. And it was a, a much more enjoyable day than I think any other committee uh, had uh, in their boring hotel rooms uh, for their, their away days. The, the Union Canal is now uh, that vibrant space uh, that, it, uh, that it deserves to be, compared even to what it was uh, 20 years ago before the investment through the Millennium Link project. And it was, it was really uh, encouraging and uh, rewarding, I think, to listen to uh, members, including Fiona Heslop, Gordon MacDonald, uh, Sarah Boyack and others, remembering the steps that have been taken uh, toward that, that journey toward the regeneration uh, of the canal. Today, people live on the canal. Barges are used for private and community use, canoe activities for clubs and schools, and people walk, wheel, and cycle uh, on the towpaths in increasing numbers. And that's being replicated across our other canals in Scotland. I believe there are around 115 boats currently moored on the Union Canal. Over 70 of them are houseboats, and that's fantastic. And the, the public value that we place on the Union Canal is very different to those, uh, those earlier industrial purposes that it had when it was built. But it and the wider canal network are real contributors to some of the really contemporary, modern themes facing Scotland today, from tourism to health and well-being, sustainability, uh, and as nature corridors supporting biodiversity, uh, they're hugely important as well. The, uh, the importance of outdoor spaces, uh, as some members have reflected, uh, during and, and since the pandemic can't be overstated. And our canals and their towpaths have performed and continue to perform a major uh, role in relation to that. That's true of the Union Canal, but also of Scotland's other canals. Uh, and I've seen some of the fantastic work undertaken by Scottish Canals and its partner organisations to build creative, active travel infrastructure. Uh, the first visit I had since taking on uh, this job as Minister, in fact, was the, the pleasure of attending the Bowling Harbour opening uh, of the bowl line. An excellent piece of work done there to redevelop 18th century infrastructure and transform a disused railway viaduct uh, into fully accessible uh, travel, active travel route, which will benefit the local community and beyond. And I, I very much enjoyed being one of the first people to cycle uh, on that fantastic new linear park. Uh, as, uh, not only as Minister for, for Active Travel, but also as someone who uses the canal towpaths regularly uh, to visit family, I see firsthand the importance of redeveloping that outdoor infrastructure for the 21st century, improving people's health and well-being uh, and encouraging green commuting. I didn't put my hand up when Graham Simpson asked about uh, doing the, the whole Glasgow to Edinburgh route. Being based in Glasgow, uh, I'm more often bound on the Forth Can Clyde Canal out to Loch Lomond and back. Uh, I have done the, uh, the Glasgow to, to Falkirk leg, uh, and I'll be doing that again early in the summer recess. Who knows, if I, uh, if I feel energetic, I might make the whole trip through to Edinburgh. might feel a little bit too much like coming to work, though. Uh, I, I also recently visited the, the Stockingfield uh, Bridge, which Bob Doris mentioned, uh, which is another example of Scottish canals working well collaboratively with others, reconnecting, in this case, three communities of Rock Hill, Gilsick Hill and Mary Hill in North Glasgow and uh, completing the last linkage in the Forth and Clyde Canal towpath. I'm not someone who particularly likes the use of the word iconic. I think it's often overused for these kind of structures, but I've, I, I've seen uh, the development of that so far. I'm really looking forward to it opening and it is going to feel so special uh, once it's once it's there yes i'd be happily give way to bob doris bob doris i, I thank the minister for, for, for giving way uh, the minister will be aware there's a vibrant community art project or projects multiple wrapped around the Stockingfield bridge getting real proper community buy and do you think the use of community art for such uh, large infrastructure developments are really important to get proper community buy-in to such iconic structures Minister. I, I couldn't have put that better. And there's, there's something about encouraging people to celebrate, uh, to feel celebratory, to feel that they've, they've created something themselves. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think uh, the Stockingfield Bridge 
uh, is going to be a very good example of that, and I'll encourage all members, once it opens, to, to go and see it for themselves. Communities do have to play uh, an important part in rege regeneration. It can't be something that's just done to people. It has to be done with and by and, and amongst people. And uh, the, the, the kind of people that I've met on many of these visits are examples of where communities have been involved in the way that Bob Doris describes in taking a sense of ownership of the, the future of their local spaces. There are many of these uh, community groups along uh, Scotland's canals doing great work. Some of them, have, uh, others have been mentioned today. And there's also a, still a strong boating community using our canals uh, and exciting developments that improve that experience. As uh, Fiona Heslop uh, noted, the £1 billion Wenchborough project, which is currently being developed with the Union Canal at its heart, is a, an exciting project. Once complete, uh, it will include a new marina with residential houses as well as moorings. And there are some other great examples of inclusive projects uh, on the Union Canal, like the Seagull Trust, which adapts boats to take disabled people out on the, the canal. I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, everybody, uh, the people and communities that live, uh, work and are active on Scotland's canal network. Through their efforts, they're making the canals the fascinating and colourful places uh, that they need to be. I can see you're uh, looking at me that we, we perhaps are coming to the end uh, of the time, but I do want to note uh, one, one final important point, that research is showing very clearly that the wider regeneration work around Scotland's canals uh, has a social purpose uh, as well. Regenerating the Forth and Clyde Canal has been shown to reduce mortality rates and lower risk of chronic health conditions uh, amongst those living alongside the canal. We, we do need to take responsibility for some of the issues that have been mentioned around litter, as well as safety, and in particular there have been concerns around women's safety in our canals. Everybody has the right to enjoy these wonderful assets in an inclusive uh, and a safe way. The Scottish Government will continue to support Scottish canals and many others in looking after these uh, historic assets for the benefit of those communities. So can I join everybody in celebrating the historic, economic, environmental and social value uh, of the Union Canal and others in this uh, bicentenary year. Look forward to participating in some of the activities that are planned for the celebration. Wish the very best to everyone taking part in tomorrow's flotilla. Uh, and once again, thank everyone uh, who lives and works around Scotland's canals for making them what they are. And I look forward to seeing that relevance continue for many years to come. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Your reading of body language is impeccable. That concludes the debate, and I suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30.